Oh, hi folks, it's uh, time for the final in my series on uh, the equipment that I use. I just call it the odds and ends because it's just the kind of the leftover stuff that I haven't talked about yet. So let's get into it. Okay, so the agenda today is uh, first I'm going to talk about food storage, not food itself, except for how it relates to the storage of the food. Um, my hiking boots very personal thing for everybody um, trekking poles and after that that's really the end of the equipment we're gonna visit the concept of base weight and I'm gonna do a, a quick uh, case study on how I might uh, further reduce weight uh, giving just an example okay so when it comes to food storage um, generally I just keep food in, in stuff sacks um, you know, Darlene finds stuff sacks for me all the time. And, and uh, one of the things when we get into the routine is going to be, you know, what do you put in which stuff sack? Um, as I mentioned, there's my pack liner bag, uh, which I can use doubles as a food bag if I need to hang it out. Um, finally, this is one of those little things that just makes life sometimes a little more convenient. And that's having this pastry container. I don't know, whoopie pies came in it or something. It's it's not real hard plastic. It weighs hardly anything, you know, less than an ounce. Um, it's strong enough that I can put trail bars in it. And that's really the reason I have it because in my pack, my trail bars would get all squished. Uh, but by having something like this to put them into, I can get probably a dozen, you know, a uh, two or three day supply of uh, uh, trail bars in here. Um, and as I take the trail bars out at the beginning of each day and, you know, the stuff in my, my uh, backpack pockets, um, I can actually maybe transfer some other food into here so that this doesn't become dead space inside my pack. Um, so just, just a little, you know, these are the little sorts of things that as a hiker you'll find work for you. Maybe this won't work for you. It works for me. It's just one of those little things like Ziploc bags. Um, Another item I own is the bear canister. Um, bear canister is not for keeping bears in, it's for keeping your food in. Um, it is a, to use it, it is a nearly a three pound commitment. It does hold quite a bit. It holds 70 cubic inches uh, is its capacity. Um, there are certain places where you would want to use it. This is if you're going to go into an area where there are known bear problems, sometimes by law you have to have a bear canister with you. I believe that's the case in the Adirondacks. Um, it's not a law in the Grand Canyon, but I think it's a good idea if you're going to be hiking in the wild parts of the Grand Canyon. If you're going to be going just down to uh, Bright Angel Camp, they have ammo boxes actually. Um, that you can put your stuff in. But uh, if I were to go into the Grand Canyon again, I would use this, I would make that two pound, nine ounce commitment to, to carry this with me. It won't fit into my pack. I had to get a special strap that is used for putting it on the top of my pack. Kind of makes it tough to use on the Appalachian Trail if you're going to be ducking under things because you'll be smacking it on stuff. Um, though, Going into the Smokies next year, as I plan to do, I may actually make that commitment. Okay, so that's it for really for all I really have to say about food storage. Uh, the next thing is uh, my hiking boots. Now, like I said, that's a very individual choice. Um, I happen to use Keen Duran mid style, the mid meaning it's it's not a full up ankle but it's not a you know sneaker size it's something in between um keen makes a, a wide version and a wide toe box and this was re actually recommended to me by uh, michael conti and it's just it's it's just worked out really nice for me one thing about sh uh, hiking shoes though uh, these do run true to size if they say it's a size 10 and a half it's a size 10 and a half I always buy at least a half size uh, larger simply because when you're out hiking, your feet swell, your feet sweat, you really need uh, something a little bit bigger. Um, if the weather's cold and you don't think your feet are going to swell, uh, we'll just throw on an extra pair of socks. So that's what I do um, there. I, I get size 11s uh, instead of my, my regular 10 and a half. And if I got an 11 and a half, that probably wouldn't be too bad either. Um, boots last about 
500 to 1,000 miles. Um, I think these Keens are better quality. We'll probably get closer to the upper end of that range. Um, I had a pair of boots uh, called Vasques or Vasquezes or something, and, and they advertised to last 600 miles. And uh, after almost exactly 600 miles, they self-destructed on me right out into the trail. I was out hiking with, uh, with Craig, and uh, I remember them falling apart. Um, I think it was in Vermont, not sure, but in any case, yeah, it's you got to re realize that the, the boots aren't forever. Um, many hikers use trail runners, and I, I ran into a lot of them on my hike from uh, Delaware Water Gap down to Roanoke. And uh, they're more like sneakers, they're like heavy duty sneakers, and I can see why people would like them, they'd be more comfortable. Um, I looked on the web, and the web says you get 300 to 500 miles out of them, but some of the hikers were telling me they were getting closer to 200 miles uh, out of them. Uh, if you're getting 200 miles out of a shoe and you're going 2,000 miles, you're going to have, go through, you're going to burn through 10 pairs in, in the course of a through hike, maybe 11 pairs in the course of a through hike. To me, that just doesn't sound very, very appetizing. Um, as it is, if my um, Keens were to last a thousand miles, I would I'd go through two sets, or, you know, two pairs of boots. Um, when I did my section hike that I just spoke of, I actually didn't use my Keen hiking shoes. I actually used Keen safety shoes uh, that were issued to me at work. They had steel toes. I had a problem with stubbing my feet a lot. Um, turned out to be a bad idea. I did go 566 miles in them, you know, with side trips and everything, probably 600 miles I walked in those shoes. They kind of tore my feet apart. They really weren't made for hiking and that turned out to be a bad idea. But, you know, lesson learned. Um, when I used my Keens for my hike in Maine that followed, you know, shortly after that section hike, uh, my feet were fine in them. Uh, the next topic is trekking poles. Um, I use these black diamond um, trekking poles. Um, it's a telescoping design. Uh, you can set it to different uh, lengths. Of course, depends on your height. Um, if you're going to be doing a lot of uphill, you might make them a little shorter. If you're going to be doing a lot of downhill, maybe you make them a little less. I've never bothered doing that, but I hear that is something uh, that uh, people uh, do. Um, they, these do act also as my uh, tent poles, and the fact that they are um, adjustable in height is even good for the tent poles because uh, I have to have them a little higher than I hike with them uh, for my, uh, you know, when I'm setting up my tent. And if I'm setting up on a tent platform, it's a different height than if the, this part here is going to be buried into the ground. You can see I'd have to, you know, add that much to the, the length of the pole. So it's really good to have them as adjustable. One thing about the adjustment, you'll see this kind of snap in place thing really makes them sturdy. I mean, they have never come apart on me on the trail except for one time I took a really bad fall that was in Maine when I talked about my first aid kit. Um, and that's the only time uh, that I, I had that problem. I guess I should have held them like this so they, so you can actually read the black diamond and the alpine carbon tip. Um, I had another pair of uh, hiking poles, uh, trekking poles, that had more of a, uh, they didn't have this kind of latch. They had a, you, you twist it and something internally would open up and by friction they would hold in place. Really bad design, really an unsafe design. I ended up throwing them out. I would never recommend that design. I don't even remember the brand. It was a reputable brand, but it was just a bad design. They kept on, as you walk, you turn, you know, you just normally twist them, twist them a little bit as just your normal motion. And that would cause them to come unlocked and slipped. And that's very dangerous, especially sometimes you do have to depend on these, uh, you know, and you may have to put your weight on it uh, at times. Uh, when you're climbing up or down, especially dangerous on the Grand Canyon. I had one collapse on me right near the edge of the plateau, um, and that's quite a drop. And fortunately, I was able to catch myself, but I got rid of those that I had then, and now this is what I use. Okay, so that's it for equipment. I'm done talking about equipment, um, about the specific equipment that I use. But let's talk about a, the concept of base weight. 
Um, base weight is this thing that the hikers throw around, you know, when they have different categories. Ultra light base weight is this, super light. It doesn't really matter that much. Uh, the categories don't matter that much. Uh, but a base weight is basically everything in your pack excluding consumables. And by consumables, I really mean food. I mean, yeah, obviously you consume food. Uh, <clears throat> your water, stove fuel, and probably toilet paper. Um, there are other things that are kind of sort of consumables. I mean, they really are consumables. Uh, my first aid kit uh, contents, um, if I have to use any first aid. My hygiene kit uh, contents especially. I mean, you can imagine the, the Germex I use up as I go along. Um, the toothpaste I use up as I go along. The soap I use up as I go along. But, you know, these are things that I don't have to Usually I have enough to last me for the whole trip, so I don't have to replenish them. So maybe instead of consumables, I should say they're replenishables. Um, another sort of in that category is your, my sunblock and insect repellent. Again, I usually just, I have enough with me to get me through the trip. Um, you know, if I'm going to be out there for 40 or 50 days, that's, you know, probably the longest trip that I'll, I'll be going on, maybe a little bit more. Uh, maybe closer to two months next year. Um, your water filters are actually a consumable. Remember I said they had, uh, depending on the filter, 750 to 1500 uh, liter capacity. Eventually that runs out, the filter's no good anymore. If you're using other kinds of water treatment like the Aquamira I, I spoke of, that's also a consumable in the strict sense. And again, probably you bring enough for your whole trip with you, so it's not something you have to worry about uh, re- uh, replenishing um, and like I just talked about boots boots are technically a consumable and when you come down to it everything's a consumable your tents are consumable your you know uh, it's eventually gonna wear out break rip whatever and you're gonna have to replace it so in that sense things are consumables but what I mean by consumables really are things you need to replenish as you go on the trail why do we make a point about base weight well because the other weight is variable. So this is like your fixed cost of hiking. And you can make decisions uh, knowing what your base weight is and how much of the other stuff you can carry. Um, you know, do you carry a whole day supply of water? I typically try doing that. Um, but if I'm going into a, an area where I know there's good uh, water supplies for me to filter out of, um, maybe only go with a half a day. Um, just, and that's less stuff I have to carry. So it's time for a weighing. Um, I'm not going to show you the weighing. Uh, my, uh, my backpack, um, my target was to get this base weight uh, down to 15 pounds. Um, so I'm going to weigh it. I have to use the cat weighing methodology. And by that, I mean I have to weigh myself. I have to pick up my pack and weigh myself on the bathroom scale, which is good to two tenths of a pound. Um, if I'm up at 15 pounds, then my, my 10 pound uh, antique scale that I used for the, the big three when I weighed them just, you know, doesn't have the capacity. So the base weight is not including consumables. I'm also not including the bear canister, a mess kit, or the kitchen sink because these things were optional. I mean, yeah, for a particular um, hike they may be part of the base weight but i'm just kind of talking about my generic hike where i don't bring those things um the clothes on my back uh but the clothes in my pack will be there um my trekking poles because i carry them my boots because that's um, something i'm wearing and my phone and my wallet because those are in my pocket so those are things i don't have to weigh so Bottom line is I went and I weighed all of this and it was 16 pounds, eight ounces. So pound and a half higher than what my target was, 10% um, higher. So the question comes, does it matter? Um, you know, is this really a concern? And I guess it's just, it's, it's just a matter of definitions. I mean, what difference does it make if I say, well, 15 pounds, under 15 pounds is ultra light and under, you know, or super ultra light if it's under 10 pounds. Well, I'm at 16 and a half pounds. Does it matter what I call it? It's, it's basically the figure I have to work with knowing that my capacity is somewhere around 30 pounds. That means those other consumables that I start out with you know, I can go a day maybe a little bit heavier, so I can bring 16 pounds of consumables out of a fresh resupply. 
and then I'm going to kind of, you know, eat that down and burn that down or wet it, wipe that down, whatever. And I'm going to get down back towards that 16 pounds near the end of a segment where I may have to resupply again. So just that's the reason we keep uh, track of base weight. It just gives us some guidance of what else we can do. So suppose I wanted to reduce my base weight. Suppose that were very important to me. Um, in, in ways it is. Um, not enough to, to go crazy over it. So from an engineering point of view, if you're trying to reduce anything, um, you look at the largest things first. And the largest thing may be the heaviest thing, which is what we're concerned with here. It may be the most voluminous thing. It may be the thing that takes the most time if you're trying to reduce a process. Um, it may be the thing that costs the the least, uh, the most, the thing that it costs, costs the most if you're trying to reduce like home expenses. Uh, you know, if you can refinance your mortgage to reduce your rate by 1%, um, that's going to save you a lot more than, you know, worrying about uh, your, you know, your phone bill. Uh, and the phone bill, of course, is worth also trying to save money on. But, uh, you know, my point is there's more room for improvement on the heavier item. So we're gonna look at my tent. It's not the heaviest thing in my pack. I guess you'd say my sleep system is, but my tent maybe is the is an individual item that has a lot of capacity or, or chance for improvement. So as you know, I have a Z-Pax duplex tent. It weighs 28 ounces when I consider the stakes in the stuff sack and, and the fact that I did get the heavier material. Now there's some alternatives that I could consider. I could consider a tarp. Tarp weighs anywhere from five to seven ounces, and you can get them in the Dyneema uh, fiber um, that I spoke of that my tent is made out of. You can get it from z -Bax. Um It's kind of expensive, but uh, it's less than half the, the cost of a tent. And, and like I said, you can get it down there, but the problem with a tarp is a tarp is to a tent what like a pavilion is to a house. Yeah, the tarp can keep you dry, not going to keep the bugs out because it's just a, it's just a like an overhead fly. Could be dual use. If I were in the Grand Canyon, I might actually consider a tarp because uh, you know you set it up during the day, you get your shade. Well, if the material is dark enough and doesn't allow the, the sun in, um, but that's something that a lot of I see. I shouldn't say a lot. I see some hikers doing. They use a tarp. They go very primitive. To me, it's not worth uh, the risk of getting drenched uh, because uh, of a wind or uh, water running underneath you. It's just like, I, I don't plan on doing it, but it is an option. So another option would be the Z-Pax Plexamid tent. They have a lot of different tents. I just happened to pick this one because, uh, you know, I saw some reviews on it. And it is a, it is like the one person version of the duplex tent. Um, it would reduce my my weight to just about a pound. I mean, that's like nearly three quarters of a pound off what my duplex weighs. Um, of course, reduce weight means reduce something else. Um, it reduces my, my floor space by seven square feet. Uh, the, the duplex has 28, almost 28 square feet. The uh, Plexamid tent, which is a one person tent, um, is uh, just under 21, uh, just over 20 uh, square feet. Now I use 14 square feet for sleeping in, in my duplex, half the tent. And the other half of the tent I use for my um, equipment. Um, but I use the 14 square feet because 14 square feet is what's available. Um, you know, I just take the stuff out, I spread it around, I can get the things easily. Do I need 14 square feet? Maybe not. Um, if I were to still use the 14 square feet for sleeping and I had to plex them in, then I'd still have seven square feet of floor space uh, for my equipment. And I might very well be able to live with that. Um, another thing it reduces, it reduces my wallet by $575 because that's what the plex them in is actually selling for right now. So um, the result of this really is I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to spend money uh, to correct a problem that I really don't think I have, um, I will revisit when I need to replace it. I mean, someday my tent's going to rip, it's going to get knocked over by the wind, maybe it's going to get hit by a comet, whatever, you know, the dinosaurs get destroyed and my tent goes with it. 
Um, and when I need to replace that tent, now I look at that $575 as being $75 less than a duplex. So, you know, that's savings there. And the there's the weight savings. And, and in that weight savings, I'm also including getting uh, lighter weight uh, stakes and, and being able to use fewer of them for the smaller tent. Um, so, uh, yeah, I might actually do it. I'll consider it. Um, I, th I think the best advice was like from Darwin on a trail where he said, if you've already got a duplex, don't go out and get a flex emitter. I mean, yeah, if you're going to buy a tent because you need to buy a tent, sure, consider the, the flex emitter. Um, it would be nice because it would get my base, my big three weight down closer to five pounds. But that's really it. Um, you know, that's the philosophy. Um, there are always lighter choices. It's uh, really nice to keep the philosophy in mind that you can make it lighter and you choose not to, and you choose not to for legitimate reasons. Again, I got 16 and a half pounds for my basic stuff I carry with me. Maybe I can leave the one pair of the set of the pant legs, you know, for my convertible pants. Uh, save a little bit there, but I'm not going to be drilling holes in my toothpaste handle. You know, I've seen that suggestion out there and it was actually serious. And it's like, that's going a little too far. So that's the end of the equipment series. Um, next, I'll be talking about uh, conditioning, getting preparing for a hike. Um, that series should be a lot shorter than this one. I don't know. This one was nine or ten videos. Uh, that one, I think, might be two or three videos. Not that preparation is any less important, but uh, I think I can cover it a lot easier. So thanks for bearing with me in this series.